Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Awesome. Sorry for this uh, slight technical setup. Um, thank you all so much again for, for tuning into this talk. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and then I will go right ahead. Okay, awesome. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with my work, I am a writer and researcher focused on the intersection of music and technology. I've been covering this space since 2015, and I've written a lot on a freelance basis for the likes of Billboard, Forbes, Music Business Worldwide, Pitchfork, NPR Music, a lot of other entertainment and business publications. And um, as of a little over a year ago, I've been focusing mostly on building out my own newsletter and Patreon membership under the umbrella term water and music. And I'm really fortunate to be in a position to be working on that full time. So I'm more of an entrepreneurial rather than a freelance writer right now, still focused on music and tech. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is what I think is on um, so many people's minds in the music industry right now, which is how to foster a more sustainable digital economy for music. Um, and I think, as I'll talk about in a couple of slides, what really thrusts people into this long overdue and always kind of like boiling conversation um, is the fact that we don't really have a physical economy anymore. Yes, merch is still being manufactured to an extent. Um, yes, people are still, uh, you know, buying physical music to an extent, but just due to a lot of places being shut down, cities being under lockdown, that economy is really slowed. Obviously the touring economy, um, which the electronic music sector specifically relies so heavily on um, is just totally off the table for, for a while. And so people have been forced to reckon with, um, I guess, the relative unsustainability of the dominant digital music model for a lot of people, namely streaming, and to try to diversify and figure out alternative models. Um, and as this, uh, I guess, caption suggests on this slide, I'm going to be talking a lot about how the new models or quote unquote emerging models that people are talking about. Some are indeed emerging. Some are, um, you know, like looking more into the future at, at standards that are not there yet. And others are actually looking back into the past, looking at things as simple as buying music um, or having a fan club, let alone, you know, supporting fans directly that um, is certainly not new, but has really re-enter the center of the music industry conversation due to the current scenario. So I actually just added this slide today. Um, it initially wasn't there, but just in the past week with everything going on um, with protests in, uh, in the US and also around the world, um, speaking out against racism, speaking out against uh, police brutality, particularly around the deaths of, um, of George Floyd. It seems like the music industry has also had, a to had to totally you know, redirect its conversations for good and reorient its entire approach to doing business um, in acknowledgement of all the issues at hand, particularly um, equity, sorry, e equitability and representation of black people and also people of color in the industry. And, um, I think it actually is super related to a lot of the companies, a lot of the models that I'm going to be talking about today, even if per se the models I'm talking about are not directly addressing racism as an issue. Um, but uh, so we're talking about, you know, sustainable economic models. Um, you cannot have sustainability without equitability. Um, if you just think about that as a concept when we're thinking about sustainable models, the underlying assumption is that it's unsustainable for artists. Um, you know, artists labor, artists say they work is being exploited and they're not um, receiving most of the income, most of the value or the profits as a result. Um, it's going to other players or intermediaries in the space. And so equitability is really at the center of this concept of sustainability. And as I just mentioned, you can't, in order to really achieve equitability or understand it, you have to follow the money. Um, this is true in politics. I think this is true in business in terms of where people really put their money and their budgets. And this is, I think, especially relevant for um, the Black community in music and entertainment. Um, I don't think you'll meet a Black person in music who doesn't know either through their own experience or through people in their network about um, 
you know, young black artists, emerging black artists being exploited um, because they don't have access to certain resources or certain tools getting thrown into um, exploitative deals at a higher rate than um, artists of other races, other um, backgrounds as well. So that, that, that's just, I, I couldn't do this presentation today, this week without addressing that issue and acknowledging that um, the issues around racism and racial equality are absolutely related to economic equality and you can't really think about one without the other, especially in an industry like music where so much cultural influence actually does come from Black culture, Black origins. So today when thinking about the digital streaming economy, or sorry, the digital music economy, um, I think one realization that a lot of people had in the music industry is that they took this cycle that I kind of laid out very simply here um, for granted, whereby in the dominant streaming model, um, you release your album on a streaming service, whether that's Spotify um, that like will pay royalties or one like SoundCloud that might not pay royalties for consumption. Um, but the assumption is that, you know, based on just how low margin the streaming model is, you, um, you, you release your album almost as a loss leading like marketing vehicle or advertisement for other higher margin physical models, namely touring for most artists. I think a lot of, if you look across the spectrum from really, you know, high level A-list artists to emerging artists, I think a lot of them make the majority of their money from tours. Um, and if, especially if you look at um, electronic artists, like, mm -hmm. sorry, the biggest artists like Steve Aoki or, or Calvin Harris, David Guetta, et cetera, um, they're on the road, you know, a hundred plus days in a year. And so touring really is their lifeblood. So of course, if you just, take that revenue stream totally off the table, um, you're left with streaming being an advertisement for what? You, you, you can't afford to have streaming just be an advertisement for a revenue stream that doesn't exist. And so people are really grappling with the fact that as a business model, as an income stream for artists, it really is not sustainable um, for, I think, I would say most artists that's not making st streaming income and digital music income is not making enough of enough money for them to you know pay their bills, pay, um, month to month rent. So um, this is kind of, yeah, the, the reckoning that the industry is having um, that is spurring a lot of the conversations around alternative models. So when thinking about new models for building a sustainable music economy, as I mentioned earlier, I'm thinking about both old and new models. And these are just four, I guess, two higher level categories of old and new. And then more specifically, four themes that I've heard come up in a lot of industry conversations about shifting priorities in what artists, labels, um, music venues, et cetera, should be investing in. Um, in this presentation today, I'm gonna to start with the old side. So thinking about old models or old technologies that have been around for decades, but for some reason had just not been prioritized by artists and their teams but now are coming um, top of mind as actually being a lot more valuable than streaming, at least in an era of, uh, you know, of quarantine, of COVID-19, when people are stuck at home. So by old models, I'm thinking specifically of live streaming or kind of live synchronous media experiences and direct to fan memberships. Um, and particularly like the monthly membership model or in general, the direct to fan model where fans are supporting artists directly and the majority of their dollar of every dollar spent is going to an artist they support. On the new side, there's um, a lot of interesting development in more immersive entertainment for music. Um, as I'll discuss later, there's a lot of interesting collaboration between music and gaming companies, um, or there are a lot of music focused companies that take inspiration from gaming in terms of the world building potential. Um, and then uh, at the bottom, the concept of digital scarcity is I think coming more to the forefront for musicians. Um, part of this is related to the live streaming conversation in that a lot of artists are realizing that they can't just continue you know, live streaming for free. And I'll talk about that issue later. But then also in general, if you think about that cycle of you know, streaming being a loss leader for touring, touring is actually very much a scarcity model whereby you only play a certain number of shows in a year, maybe only one show, in one city every year for a limited audience. And so you can charge more for premium for that experience. And basically in exchange for 
that revenue stream being off the table, a lot of artists have been pressured to post a lot of content online for free, um, which is the opposite of scarcity and is not sustainable for, for anybody. I think a lot of artists feel exhausted right now, um, especially you know being a couple months into this lockdown situation. So, so later, at the end of this presentation, I'll dive into some examples of the companies and models that are, ex are experimenting with digital scarcity. First off, let's uh, start with live and social audio, um, sorry, live video and social audio, which I think are the most popular and um, definitely fastest growing modes of fan engagement and soon of monetization um, within the music industry that um, as a technology has actually been around for over two decades. I believe the first ever live stream in around 1993, 1994, was an indie concert, like an indie rock concert. Um, the Rolling Stones put on like one of the first live streams shortly thereafter. Um, and a lot of the biggest tools for live streaming, namely, you know, Instagram Live, Facebook Live, um, Twitch, those have been around for uh, around like five to 10 years, but they've never seen the amount of, the amount of activity that um, the industry, that fans have seen in the past couple of months alone. Um, and I think this will have significant long-term impact now that we've been in this for long enough on the way that artists engage with fans. Here are some stats um, that I, I hope help illustrate just the sheer amount of growth and also the amount of engagement with some of the top live streaming platforms. So there's over a 500% growth in viewership of music content on Twitch. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Twitch, um, their site is just twitch.tv. They're a live streaming platform that had catered primarily to the gaming community. So most of their streams were um, just people live streaming themselves playing video games. But now their fastest growing category in general is outside of gaming. It's like, whether it's music or it's like people just chatting and talking about everyday life. And they're really investing in non-gaming content. Music is certainly riding that wave now and has been um, ever since mid-March when, yeah, like all the major tours and um, festivals got canceled. And so it's seen this, yeah, this massive, this massive growth in viewership. Um, in the middle, Bands in Town is one of the few apps that is trying to build discovery infrastructure around live streaming. <clears throat> Sorry, and they've, they published some interesting stats, some of which I've written about, um, about just how fans are engaging with live streaming discovery um, more differently than with in-person physical events. And one interesting stat that I think is relevant from the engagement standpoint is that 80, there's an 80 percent click-through rate on push notifications on fans of towns live streaming reminders. Um, I believe the average click-through rate for uh, for a push notification reminder for a show is closer to 10 percent. And so I think there are a couple of reasons for this. One, um, Obviously, I, th I think there are like so many more live streams going on at any given time online than there used to be. And so it's definitely overwhelming. So we need better discovery infrastructure and fans are looking for that and actually signing up and engaging more with these reminders um, than, than they normally would. And then last but not least, there is um, more than a 70% jump in Instagram live usage from mid-March to mid-April, um, just in general. And I think this is of no surprise to people who have followed or even been adjacent to live streaming in any way in music recently. Um, I believe all of the videos that broke uh, broke concurrent viewership records for live streams on Instagram were all from musicians. Um, whether it's the versus battles, um, you know, that Timbaland and Swiss Beats have been hosting in the past couple months, or um, regular shows like Tory Lane's Quarantine Radio that regularly attract um, tens if not hundreds of thousands of concurrent viewers. For every session. Here are just a couple of um, notes that I'll go through quickly in terms of why I think live streaming is especially important and why people are investing in it. Um, I think one major difference from on-demand video or on-demand audio, um, like on platforms like Spotify and YouTube, is that both the engagement and monetization is in real time, which I guess is, it makes sense, and that's kind of, I guess, a basic fact about the live streaming format. But I think it's super powerful in terms of understanding how fans are actually responding to you in real time and being able to interact with them in real time, as opposed to having more of like a lag in that response. Um, and 
yeah, as I write here, the monetization opportunities in this kind of real time, much more efficient way are also much more diverse than what the dominant streaming model offers. So if you think about the Twitch model alone, um, you can stream for free. Uh, you can have, you can allow fans to tip you in real time during a stream. Um, and fans can also subscribe to your channel for a monthly fee um, in order to, you know, get access to whether it's like an exclusive community on Discord or exclusive subscriber only streams or chat rooms. So there's the, the access and community element to that subscription as well. Um, none of those features for now are available on Spotify or I would say even Instagram or Facebook. Um, I think because people are stuck at home and engaging more with live streams, live streaming really is at the forefront. It is like a leading indicator of culture and of people's interest in culture and music much more than on-demand content. And so as a result, the platforms that do have live streams are really pushing them in their search and recommendation algorithms. I think you're starting to see that more with YouTube, um, certainly more with Facebook and Instagram. So for those who are, but for those who are thinking about discoverability, and, and reach, um, that's definitely something to, something to consider in terms of being aware of the platform's incentives as well. And um, the screenshot on the right here is actually not a video app. It's a social audio app called Clubhouse that is actually quite popular in the, um, I guess, Silicon Valley and tech world. Um, and it's similar to House Party, for any of you who know that app, where um, you can basically join these spontaneous audio chat rooms um, with people in your social network. And so House Party is video based, but Clubhouse is audio only. And Clubhouse only has like a couple of thousand beta users right now, but they just raised uh, a $10 million, sorry, no, they, they raised um, several million dollars in funding that uh, puts their valuation at over $100 billion, I believe. Um, and so people are really excited about this model. And there are a lot of um, musicians and cultural influencers who are not using the app. So if you look at the screenshot, um, MC Hammer, uh, a lot of like old school hip hop um, rappers and, and creators like Fat Five Freddy, E40, um, are using the app pretty frequently uh, to talk about things that aren't related to music. Um, at one point, they're recently they're talking about uh, prison reform. Um, they've definitely been talking about current events recently, like all the protests that have been happening, not really about music, but um, there were, as, there were like 80 to 100 people listening to just a conversation they were having with each other at any given time. And so there's definitely engagement with this kind of live shared conversation model. And all that is to drive home the fact that the intimacy of this format makes it most effective when you're communicating something, not just performing. And that's something that I think is really important to drive home, that if you just put on a more detached performance in the live stream, like you would on stage, without really engaging with the viewers and taking advantage of the social mechanics of the platform you're using. Um, you might as well not do it live at all. You might as well just put it on YouTube and make it available on demand. And so the people who are able to like make it a truly interactive and communicative rather than just performative experience, I think um, have, have the best, have the most success. And the versus battles are a great example of this because those aren't performances. They're just, you know, to, um, I guess amazing artists, legends talking to each other and playing and playing music for each other. But even that just attracts hundreds of thousands of viewers at the same time. What I'm going to do for each of these sections is not really say um, is, is is try to emphasize not it's like hard advice because because I think like we shouldn't be lying to ourselves. Everyone's still trying to figure this out. No one really has any of the answers right now in terms of the future of music. Um, Instead, I want to pose some open questions for people who want to build and develop a new kind of experience or a new kind of app or just business model in general in this space. Um, I think just because this time is so um, disruptive and in, in the true sense of the word disruption, I think it's, it's really anyone's game to build what comes out of this. Um, and so here are just some prompts that come to mind for me that I know a lot of people in the industry are talking about um, that, that the people are looking to build and experiment with the answers. Um, so the first question is how to segment the increasingly crowded market of live streaming platforms. I'll actually talk about this later um, in a later slide. In, you'll see it visualized, but there are several dozen different live streaming platforms available out there right now. Um, 
<clears throat> sorry, every, everyone's trying to build kind of for the same customer, like the artist who wants to live stream a concert for their fans, um, free and or paid. And I don't, I don't see that being sustainable if we're talking about a sustainable ecosystem in terms of like all of these different kinds of companies essentially building copycats off of each other. And so there's an interesting conversation now about how to segment different platforms for different kinds of experiences. Like maybe Instagram Live is best for these free kind of mass scale um, experiences, whereas there might be some other platforms that focus on more premium, more paid experiences for super fans. Um, I think having more clarity around that kind of segmentation will also help artists um, or any, any other people who are listening to this evaluate opportunities better to make sure that you know, the platform you're using is actually aligning with what you're trying to achieve in the live stream. Secondly, speaking of monetization, what are more interesting formats for live streams aside from just straight performances or you know, putting on an archive show that people will actually be willing to pay for? Um, Billboard and uh, formerly Nielsen Music, now under the name MRC, they released a recent report on kind of the state of the music industry in COVID-19. And um, as part of the report, they held a survey and they found that 29% of the general population, um, only 29% uh, say they're willing to pay for a virtual concert. Um, I think it's still a relatively low number um, and it's kind of a chicken or egg issue. Maybe, yes, most people are ready to pay for a live stream, but I would argue that 99% of them have not had the opportunity to. Artists have not taken that step to offer this kind of paid live streaming experience that's really bespoke and really premium and interesting, um, aside from everything that people have been seeing on Twitch and Instagram Live. So that's a question to keep in mind. How do we innovate around this format enough such that people actually find value in it? And last but not least, how do we give artists and independent music organizations a seat at the table in terms of figuring out the future economics of this space? Because um, right now, in terms of who has influence over these platforms, it's their parent companies, which are all big tech conglomerates. So, you know, Amazon for Twitch, Facebook for Instagram, Google for YouTube, et cetera. Um, so I'd love to, whether it's through some kind of coalition or some kind of actual hiring and bringing people in house, um, having artists, you know, actually truly giving artists a voice and influence over product development as well. The second trend I wanna talk about is um, direct to fan memberships. So with streaming, I think if you want one other element of the streaming model is, is not just that it's low margin, but the way that royalties are paid out is not direct to the artist um, in that it's paid on a pro rata model. So if you only spend your Spotify subscription listening to like some indie artist with a hundred followers, they're not going to get your money. Your money goes into a pool that is then divided up by market share. So it's not direct. Um, and it's certainly not immediate. If you're lucky, you can get your Spotify royalties in a couple of weeks to a month, but um, more realistically, sorry, more realistically for a lot of artists, especially those signed to bigger labels, it's more like every couple months, or maybe you might have to wait several months to a year. Um, and also because of the nature of streaming, I feel like it's not as predictable. So in short, artists are looking for channels that are more direct, more immediate, and more predictable in terms of their revenue impact, especially right now, um, as a lot of them can't really afford or find it difficult to think long-term. They're thinking short-term, like how do I survive this month? How do I survive this week? Um, and streaming, frankly, is not the best channel to, to ensure that. Um, so in this presentation, I want to talk about some platforms that are really good for this, um, including but not limited to Bandcamp and um, membership sites like Patreon. Here are some stats, again, that illustrate the growth of direct-to-fan and paid membership models in the past couple of months. So this is actually quite timely because tomorrow is the third day that Bandcamp is going to be waiving their transaction fees for artists. So tomorrow is a really good day to, if you're a fan to buy music because all of your money will go to the artist. Um, so, so they've done this twice already over the course of a 24 hour period each time, um, one in late March and one in, on May 1st. And over those two days, fans paid over $11 million. Um, and I think that's definitely like broken a record for Bandcamp in terms of the amount of money that people have paid in that amount of time. And it's really interesting how I think music fans have been super vocal and passionate about you know sharing the records that they bought on Bandcamp and supporting artists along the way 
and not so much about you know the music they, the music they streamed on Spotify, let alone you know like Spotify has a tipping feature. I have I've heard like close to nothing about that. And I think I think there's a reason for that because people are aware now of kind of the back end economics of how the money flows to artists through these different channels, and they're prioritizing ones that are more direct and more immediate. And then with Patreon, which for those of you who are not aware, um, is like a monthly membership platform. So uh, there are actually two different models. You can either charge fans a monthly fee for access to this kind of monthly membership experience with exclusive content, access to a community of like-minded fans, or what a lot of musicians do is that they charge um, fans per project. So if you put out one project a month, say, uh, or one project every couple of months, fans will only pay once you put that project out. So it might actually be better for people who don't necessarily want to feel the pressure of putting out new content, fresh material every single month. So there are a couple of different models on Patreon and in, uh, and since early March, so since around when, you know, a lot of events got canceled, there's been over 200% increase in the number of musicians who have since joined Patreon. And one stat that I, I did not include here, but I actually just learned recently from Patreon's team is that there's also been nearly a 70% increase in the amount that people are giving to musicians. Um, this actually, I think, is contrary to the wider economic landscape, where I believe it's like 40 million people um, in the US who filed for unemployment. Um, obviously, the, the wider economy is in a really difficult situation, but, but people who have the means are still really interested in supporting their favorite artists and creators. And, and Patreon is, um, I think, a really good example of that. Here on the right um, are just some examples of artists who um, have launched Patreon pages either recently or have been running one for a really long time. Um, no Name runs actually a book club, the rapper who's pictured above. Um, she runs a book club um, focused on highlighting Black authors and thinkers um, and like writers of color in general. <clears throat> and the bottom two artists, Zola Jesus, um, has several hundred fans on Patreon, at least in the Yeji. A DJ recently launched her own Patreon page and is giving a lot of exclusive art um, to fans because she's also a visual artist herself. And on the left here, um, just quickly, I have a list of criteria that I think um, are important for artists to think about when considering launching a membership. And a lot of this is actually based on my own experience running a Patreon page and getting to a point where I'm able to do it full time. I learned a lot of stuff along the way as a writer that I think parallels the music industry quite a bit. So one is that the, prior, the underlying priority is serving super fans rather than maximizing exposure. Um, I remember when I first launched my Patreon page, I only had like 40 to 50 patrons, I would say, in like the first month. And to be in that mindset of posting an article where you're happy that it's only reaching 50 people instead of 5,000 or 500,000 people, which it might do on like a free publication or on a service like Spotify, you really have to be like happy with that and be happy and be like really cognizant of segmenting fans and serving different groups of fans differently. That's just, I think, something that you have to have even prior to approaching Patreon to ensure success and growth. A lot of artists who are running these memberships also make it a lot more personal. Um, and so there's a willingness to be a lot more open and vulnerable about their creative process, which drives a lot of the content that they're posting um, in their membership. Um, and so if you aren't comfortable with being as open, maybe a monthly recurring membership model might not be the best option. Um, a lot of membership programs also rally fans around certain values or causes. I think No Names Book Club, um, which also uh, works with a lot of um, like local prisons in, in terms of donating books to local, pris uh, to local prisoners, I think um, is a really good example of this in terms of being, in terms of fans paying into a cause that's bigger than just the individual artist, or even just a group of fans. I think that's super effective. Um, and finally, consistency, I think, is really key, especially for the monthly membership approach. Um, a lot of artists who I think have built the biggest bases on Patreon um, are posting as much as once or more every single week, such that fans will continually get value out of the membership. And this is certainly not for every artist. I know that already, like, especially in this climate, artists face so much pressure to post a lot of content online. Um, so if, if, if you're in a position where you can't really invest in that or don't have the bandwidth to especially 
manage a community of fans, of super fans, or at least like hire someone or work with someone to help you manage that, um, then maybe now is not the perfect time. So all this, all this to say that there is some thinking and planning that goes to membership. It's not, it won't be affected if you just set it and forget it. Here are the open questions that I have for people interested in building and developing in this space. One, despite the fact that there is so much growth um, in music on Patreon and that there are a lot of musicians making a full-time living off, off the platform, it's really hard to find a membership playbook for music specifically. I've looked for this myself in doing research in this space, trying to find some kind of, um, it doesn't even have to be a template, just like wider discussion around how musicians can make the most of a membership model. Um, that isn't really out there. So I think now is a really good time for people who are adopting this model to exchange knowledge um, because I think it can go a really long way in making digital income more sustainable and more predictable for artists. Um, the second question is actually related to Patreon specifically. So I think Patreon has gotten a lot of critique from the creative community because they are um, heavily venture backed. I believe they've raised over 150, 160 million dollars and their CEO, Jack Conti, who's a musician himself, um, has spoken out about how their original model, which was like very low fee, they only took 5%, um, was actually not sustainable given how much money they had raised and what their expectations were in terms of returns. Um, and so there are actually a couple of people building alternative membership models in response to that. Um, two examples that come to mind that I listed on a previous slide include Ampled, and currents and Ampled specifically is adopting a platform cooperative model where the artists who sign up and join the platform actually have a have sh have a share they have equity in the platform um, and so they'll they'll also benefit from the platform's growth and profits so that's just something to keep in mind um, patreon certainly is not the only only answer out there i think it's better if there are more diverse models and companies that contribute to artist memberships in this, a similar way then finally, um, how do membership models benefit collectives and organizations and not just individual artists? Um, I think this is super important in the context of thinking about, I guess, the, the widespread image of the DIY artist, um, you know, the DIY independent artist. Uh, DIY, the letters stand for do it yourself. And so I think there's a lot of emphasis on like the individuality of being a musician, when in reality, it really takes so much collective effort. And I think if we're talking about making the music industry more sustainable, there really has to be more collective group work rather than artists kind of being more isolated and shouting to like, you know, within their own bubbles. I think that only exacerbates the problem. So I'm really interested in seeing membership models, um, like membership programs around indie labels, um, around venues, I think is especially relevant right now, given that touring is canceled for a while. Um, so I think it's just as important to develop for those customers rather than just individual artists and creators. Now, for the rest of this presentation, we're going to be talking about more futuristic and forward-looking trends that are coming up today in conversation. Um, the first one involves avatars and synthetic media. And I think there are a couple of reasons why at the concept of the avatar, which I think of generally as any kind of digital, uh, yeah, any kind of digital representation of a body or a being, um, in some kind of immersive environment. Why, why is that relevant for music right now? So the couple of reasons. One is, I think, consumer behavior. So um, I think in the first couple of weeks of lockdown, audio streaming actually went down um, for several weeks in a row. Whereas over the same time period, gaming, co gaming consumption skyrocketed, film and TV consumption also skyrocketed. So people kept turning to audio visual media as their primary cultural consumption. Um, and even in like recent reports, as Billboard recently reported, audio streaming is, is back in a state of growth, but music video consumption and general video consumption, I think is growing a lot more quickly. So, um, so people are seeking more immersive, long form, more, I guess, uh, escapist kind of entertainment, um, especially if you're thinking about games. And so I know a lot of artists and labels and event organizers are thinking about how to align what they're doing already with their music with this new kind of more immersive paradigm. And naturally, along the way, you're going to build an avatar of yourself as an artist or whomever you're working with. 
to live in these kinds of environments. And then also, um, I, I, I just mentioned music videos. That's actually a great example of how avatars are actually practical, not just futuristic and idealistic. Because right now, it's hard for people to get together in, um, at least legally speaking, I guess people have been, um, you know, gathering in, in, in for protests recently, so this might change, change things. But um, under kind of COVID-19 guidelines, you know, you couldn't gather in large groups of people in general. And you have to, to do that to put on, you know, to produce a really premium music video. But um, a lot of like music video shoots I know were canceled. And so as a result, you saw more and more music videos being animated. Um, it was a really interesting kind of shift in, in style that it again is not new, but definitely like became the standard um, under lockdown. And also if you're gonna have an animated video, you're gonna have to animate yourself as an artist um, and kind of have this avatar of yourself. So it's both a um, creative necessity and a promotional necessity as I write here, because um, you really have to think about they can like an avataristic way to meet fans where they increasingly are. <laughs> um, one trend that I think is really interesting that has also been happening for a couple of years, but has certainly been accelerated by the pandemic is that it's kind of two way. So in one direction, celebrities are becoming avatars and then in the other direction, avatars are becoming celebrities. So in one direction, you have celebrities making avatars of, of themselves um, whether to, you know, increase their scale on social media so they don't always have to, you know, be in every social post or to live specifically in these more immersive games. So the examples that are pictured here that I think are the most relevant, um, in the top right, you have Jay Balvin. He partnered with this avatar company called Genies to make an avatar of himself that appears in a lot of social media posts. And if you look on his spot, um, his latest album, Colores, um, it, in sorry, for the canvas videos for that album, they're all his avatar, not himself. Um, so he, he's one of the artists investing most heavily in his genies figure specifically. The bottom row on the left side, you have Travis Scott, who recently uh, put on a show in Fortnite. And I believe over the course of all the viewings that he held for the show, there were over 27 million unique viewers, um, many of whom tuned in twice or more than once to view the show. Um, and if you saw like clips of that, it was definitely like larger than life. I think it cost just as much to produce as a normal, as a normal Coachella set would produce. Um, so it's a really premium experience. And then in the middle in the bottom row, you have Tanashi, um, an R&B artist who partnered with the startup called Wave on virtual concerts. And this, for this, I, I believe this was prior to the pandemic, she actually wore a full body motion capture suit um, and the Wave team developed this immersive environment that tracked your movements in real time and mapped it um, onto this avatar. And so that's definitely an emerging model that requires a lot of high tech to, to execute on. In the other direction, you have avatars becoming celebrities. And this is actually not that different at all from what production companies like Marvel or Disney already do. If you think about the Marvel empire, I guess they have a lot of fictional characters that manifest themselves across multiple different kinds of media, whether that's comic books, um, movies, games, etc. So the same thing is happening here. It just happens to be a music focus. So one of the most popular and, and notorious examples is Lil Michaela, who was developed by um, this company based in Los Angeles called Bread, that is making these kind of virtual influencers is what a lot of people call them. But Michaela has also released a lot of music um, she has uh, a couple songs on Spotify that have a couple million streams and there are a lot of human songwriters and producers working behind the scenes to make music um, that I think a human artist who acts as Michaela creates. So it's a really interesting model. I recommend um, you look more into that. In the middle here you have um, a company called Strange Loop that um, is building a virtual label from scratch and they recently um, did the Techstars Music 2020 uh, program of the, of the Techstars Accelerator. And I know they're working with human artists as well to make music and content for these virtual beings that's coming out this year. And on the bottom right, um, this is uh, Kazuna AI. Um, she actually performed at a virtual festival recently, Porter Robinson's um, Secret Sky Festival. She's part of a group of several thousand 
YouTubers or virtual YouTubers that are essentially these anime style characters that have really big followings on YouTube. Um, and Kazuna happens to have a really significant musical and performing component to her as well. Um, as I mentioned, virtual concerts need virtual worlds, which is why you're seeing so many of these artists partner with gaming companies. Um, and so whether it's like Travis Scott and Fortnite, Wave is the company I mentioned that is working with Tanashi, and Minecraft is also very quickly emerging as a popular platform for concerts, in part because unlike Fortnite and Wave, Minecraft is actually a totally decentralized DIY environment. So anyone can go in, um, build their own venue and their own server, and organize their own event. Um, Minecraft has like really had no say in a lot of the festivals that have taken place recently. So I think thinking about sustainability, thinking about you know including more artists into this trend, I think models like what Minecraft has going on right now um, are are one potential path forward. These are the open questions that I have in mind. So as I was just talking about, how do we make the avatar economy accessible to more artists? There are only so many artists who will be able to have the resources and the scale to justify a Fortnite deal or to do um, a concert with Wave where it takes you know, a couple of weeks worth of development. How do we make the tools available for any kind of artist to take advantage of this almost as like an aesthetic trend, not just a commercial one, to make interesting experiences around their music, even if they have relatively small audiences or small budgets. Um, that's related to the next question in terms of how artists can develop the right skills and hire the right people on their teams, um, drawing from both the gaming and the film world, I think, to be able to make these kinds of immersive experiences. And I think along the way, it also expands, if not totally rewrites, what it means to be an artist. It's definitely not just putting out records anymore and touring. Um, it's really thinking about building immersive worlds, building immersive experiences or narratives around your avatar that fans will be interested in. Um, it may not be for everyone, but it's definitely a new creative path that could be inspiring. And last but not least, one concern people have is the, the notion of avatars replacing artists, existing activities. I personally don't think that that's going to happen. At least it hasn't really been normalized yet, but that's just something to keep in mind. Some people actually want their avatars to replace them because they're just tired and exhausted and don't want to be on the road, don't want to be posting um, all the time. Um, but this, I think there's like a balance that has to be um, made there in terms of what gets the most prominence and what gets the most opportunity. Last but not least, um, the concept of digital scarcity. So as I mentioned towards the beginning, Boring is so effective for artists because it's a scarcity driven model. Um, you know, artists only plays a certain number of shows every year for a certain number of people every year, and that justifies charging admission. But artists are, feel a lot of pressure to do now in the wake of their tour getting canceled is being everywhere online. It's like kind of abandoning the, abandoning the scarcity model altogether um, and adopting instead a model of digital ubiquity, which I mentioned through streaming and social media and live streaming which is not sustainable for anybody. Um, you know, whether you're um, a big artist or a small artist, it's not sustainable mentally, emotionally, or, or physically, I think, let alone financially. So I want to talk through some models that are emerging around digital scarcity. And to figure out what the different models are, we can look to what the models of scarcity are in the physical brick and mortar music business. So as I mentioned, there are scarce events. Um, you know, there are concerts, tours, festivals that only take place once a year. Coachella can charge several hundred dollars for a ticket because it's a very scarce experience. There are scarce connections. Um, a lot of fans are willing to pay top dollar to get access to their favorite artists. Um, you often see this in the form of, you know, front row seats or kind of VIP fan meet and greet kind of experiences, which normally cost an additional amount of money. And then finally you have scarce objects. This is a pretty you know, basic and popular concept in terms of only manufacturing and issuing limited editions of certain objects, whether that's merch or vinyl. So there are these three types, events, connections, and objects, and emerging models of all, the, all these three categories are coming up in the digital world. First one, um, as I mentioned before, and that's something you may be familiar with, is the model of digitally scarce events. Um, and given that most digital events are taking place through live streams, this normally takes the the, the form of 
ticketed live streams, where you take the traditional ticketed model of offline and bring it online. Um, there, I think in terms of like the format of these kinds of events and what fans are paying for, I think they're paying as much for production as they are for access, whether that's closer access to the artist or closer access to like-minded community of fans. I think there's a really big opportunity for artists to improve the way that they take advantage of horizontal interaction among attendees. Um, this certainly applies to conferences as well, actually, in terms of you know, how to make, how to recreate the spontaneity of networking and chatting among other people at a conference and online environment, it's certainly not easy. One issue that I see that I think I mentioned earlier is that there's actually very little differentiation among all these different platforms that you see. So I, I include the logos of just a handful of examples of the new live streaming platforms that are out there that allow artists to charge for admission. Aside from one-off talent partnerships, maybe data analysis capabilities in the back end, there isn't that much difference. So I foresee either consolidation or certainly some of these companies are not going to last um, beyond a year, no offense to them, but th th that's just something to keep in mind as this um, ecosystem develops and as you figure out which platform is actually right for you. Now, so the second category is connection. What do digitally scarce artist fan connections look like? There are a handful of platforms that are organizing either on demand or live fan meet and greet or messaging kind of experiences. Um, I'll highlight a couple of companies. So Fundo, which is actually developed as a side project out of Google, um, Chatalyzed, Looped, QJam, and Jemmy. All of those offer artists and any kind of influencer the ability to, the ability for artists, yeah, the ability to host these live meet and greets with fans. So whereas in person, it would take place maybe in a room where you're meeting, you're hugging or shaking hands with the artist and taking a photo with them. These normally take place over a FaceTime kind of experience. And a lot of them have like a shared queue with fans where you can chat with fans ahead of meeting the artist directly. You can take a screenshot of your video chat with the artist to share on social media. So there's a kind of a viral network effect um, kind of attached to the event as well. There are also apps like Cameo that I mentioned here that um, are on demand in that all, all the talent listed on Cameo, they charge a certain amount for a couple minute long video messages, customizable video messages. So right now I could pay, you know, a certain, um, <clears throat> sorry, a certain actor or actress or musician that I like on Cameo to record a birthday message for my friend or for someone in my family. Um, and I'll usually return it within 24, 48 hours. Um, I know a lot of, uh, yeah, certain kinds of talent, interestingly, more emerging or like B-list, C-list talent, not like A-list talent that are making a lot of money through the platform. Um, last but not least in the digital scarcity kind of categories are digitally scarce objects. And this is something that is conceptually, I think, the most emerging in terms of models not even being built, let alone proven or let alone gaining traction um, among artists or fans. So what, what am I thinking about when I think of like a digital object? I'm thinking of like a digital collectible or a digital piece of clothing. Um, and I think in thinking about digital objects, the concept of scarcity might understandably not make that much sense. I mean, especially in the context of the music industry where I think a lot of people have taken, um, have accepted that digital scarcity just won't work whether it's due to the ongoing popularity of piracy year after year, or the fact that you know, exclusive streaming deals, um, like what Apple Music and Tidal do, aren't actually super effective in getting subscribers. I think people mentally have been past that, but there are a couple of companies that I've pictured here that are doing really interesting things with, the digital, with, with making digitally scarce objects around artists. So one possibility is making these digital trading cards or collectibles. Um, there's actually a lot of buzz about this uh, a couple of years ago, around 2015, around the hype of blockchain technology. Um, a lot of people in music were building blockchain powered startups to make these digital trading cards available because one thing that blockchain enables is um, it reduces fraud, it verifies ownership, and it's really good for tracking provenance. So, I think this is especially relevant in the case of like fine art or like really expensive visual art 
in terms of like, you know, seeing who auctioned what, um, when was it auctioned, what was the price, and like really verifying ownership in that way. There are a couple of apps like Our Song, which is pictured at the bottom right here with these iPhone screenshots where fans can buy these digital limited edition trading cards um, that only live on their phone. And in exchange, they get access to a certain fan, closed fan community um, that has an artist as well. There, um, so also there's a company called Landmark, pictured in the top right. And one, one interesting approach they're doing is, <clears throat> sorry, is um, geofencing objects. So they've already worked with a couple of artists and labels to drop new music or new digital merch releases or other digital objects only within certain cities. And they kind of drop it on a hyper local level over time um, to roll it out to like, you know, fans in specific cities in a certain order. I think that's a really interesting model. Not that dissimilar to how touring works actually, but um, utilizing the power of, of digital online technology. And then lastly, there's a concept of virtual digital merch. And to understand this concept, we can actually look to the gaming world, which already makes billions of dollars off of this business model. Especially if you look at um, a game like Fortnite, I believe they make over a billion dollars every year just from sales of skins, um, or I guess like, yeah, this kind of digital clothing for your avatar, or weapons or other cosmetic add-ons. Um, and so it makes sense within these games where you have a character and you're embodying this character throughout your experience of playing the game. Um, so it's really interesting to think about what that might look like for any person who has a merch business, including but not limited to an artist or label, how do you take that concept of virtual digital merch and clothing outside of a gaming environment? One example, um, which is pictured in the bottom left here, you see this woman, um, I believe she's standing on a roof in New York, and she's wearing a 100% digital dress that was auctioned off for, I think a little over $9,000. Um, a couple of years ago using blockchain. Um, and it was, it was a successful transaction. Um, this woman just like owns this digital copy of the dress. Um, and I guess because of blockchain, it's impossible to you know, ma make a copy of it without consent from, from the owner. Um, and I, I know that, so this dress was made by a company called The Fabricant and they're working with existing physical fashion brands like Tommy Hilfiger on these digital clothing lines. So I think that could be a really interesting collaboration opportunity for musicians, um, especially if they're looking to increase their presence in a gaming environment, but also independent of gaming. Um, thinking about, you know, how could a digital clothing line apply to social media or apply to going back to the avatar economy, um, what a lot of these avatars are doing without really, you know, an in-person physical presence. The open questions that I have for the digital scarcity model um, are, I guess in this current time, it is really important to strike a balance between scarcity and accessibility. Um, I think if anything, this time and the whole live streaming boom has taught people about the importance of keeping things accessible um, and not just trying to cash in on a certain trend or not try to extract profits from people, millions of whom are out of a job right now. So that's something to keep in mind moving forward. Um, similarly to making live streams that people will pay for, what digital goods are fans actually willing to pay for? I think that's, that's as yet unanswered in music, but we could potentially look to gaming, as I mentioned, um, which makes you know, billions of dollars a year off of this model, like fashion that have already adopted this concept of digital fashion. Um, and collaborating more with those industries and reaching outside the confines of just the music industry to make this come to life. Um, and then it also might finally make technologies like blockchain and cryptocurrency, which, which kind of feel taboo or people kind of avoid those topics right now, actually make them have their moment and have a real use case, especially in this time where the alternative, uh, namely digital ubiquity, is not sustainable for a lot of artists. That is it for my presentation. Thank you all so much for watching. I've included some contact info in the bottom right here. Um, my email, my social handles on um, Twitter and Instagram are the same, sherryhoo42. And here's a short link to my newsletter, bit.ly slash water and music. Thank you so much.